Hi, everyone. My name is Lexi Thomas, and I'll be your moderator today. We are pleased that you could all join us for this week's lecture in Volume 6 of our No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists, including standing members of our No Neuropsychology Board, as well as our awesome members of the current rotating committee. One of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free didactics, and you can find all of our lectures on our YouTube account. Please subscribe to get updates as new lectures are uploaded. New this year to No Neuropsychology is our collaboration with Absent and developing learning and discussion questions for selected webinars. You can access these on our website. Before we start, here are the disclaimers for the series. First, this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Any clinical or research data contained herein may not be used without express permission of the speakers and no neuropsychology. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website later this week. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Fernandez, Aaron Caseda, and Dr. Julia Mayetta for today's lecture. Dr. Fernandez is the past chair of the American Psychological Association of Graduate Students, and she currently serves on the APA Board of Directors and APA Council of Representatives. She also held several other roles in APA, including an executive committee member for the Summit on the Future of Psychology, Education, and Practice. Prior to her participation in APA, Dr. Fernandez was a highly engaged graduate student member of the Georgia Psychological Association. She recently completed her graduate degree from Georgia State University and internship at the Washington DC VA Medical Center, where she will continue as a neuropsychology postdoc. Erin Caseda is the current chair of the American Psychological Association of Graduate Students Advocacy Coordinating Team the Asian Neuropsychological Association, Student Committee and Japanese Special Interest Group, and the New to Neuropsychology Resource Development Committee. She also serves on the Women in Neuropsychology Committee and as a federal policy advocate for the National Brain Tumor Society. Past leadership roles have included serving as a chair and cognitive science representative on the AP Science Student Council. She is beginning her fifth year in the clinical psychology PhD program at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago, Illinois, where she studies the impact of cancer and its treatment on cognition. Lastly, Dr. Julia Mayetta earned her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She completed her internship in neuropsychology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, where she will continue on as a neuropsychology postdoc fellow. Dr. Mayetta was the past chair of the Presidential Task Force for Marketing for the Society of Clinical Neuropsychology, focusing on marketing and branding division 40. She received an SCN presidential citation for her work on this initiative. She also serves as a founding member of No Neuropsychology. Other past leadership roles have included chair of the APEX Convention Committee and chair of the National Academy of Neuropsychology Student and Postdoc Resident Committee. Everyone, please join me in welcoming our speakers, Dr. Fernandez, Aaron and Dr. Mahera, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, so um, we will be talking today about fostering leadership and advocacy in psychology. We'll be presenting some work that um, is building on a symposium that we gave at the APA 2022 convention. Um, so go ahead and click the next slide, Julia. So I will be um, presenting first on some of the, the benefits of leadership and advocacy, um, essentially providing an overview of what the literature says. 
Um, unfortunately, like there is quite a dearth of research on this information, uh, particularly applied to neuropsychology, but our colleagues in academic medicine and nursing have actually been looking into this for many years. Um, so there's a pretty robust literature base uh, demonstrating the concrete benefits of having health professionals, academics, um, and others associated with the field involved in leadership and advocacy work. Um, so leadership skills in particular, um, often measured by participation in formal leadership programs, um, as well as objective rankings of leadership skills by those who are being supervised. Um, in medical settings have been associated with improved patient outcomes, so lower patient mortality and uh, shorter duration of hospital stays, better workplace safety outcomes, uh, so fewer safety incidents uh, for employees higher levels of workplace psychological safety. So again, those in the workplace um, endorsing kind of a feeling of I'm comfortable um, expressing my needs or my feelings, I'm comfortable sharing ideas, um, as well as representation at all levels of decision making. You can go ahead and click for the next slide, Julia. When we're thinking about advocacy skills, they also give clinical psychologists a place at the table where decisions about things like scope of practice, reimbursement, and other major policy decisions are made. Um, the APA Advocacy Office has a great uh, you know, breakdown of this, um, a little infographic that I think is available on the, on the advocacy webpage. But if you look across different healthcare professions, um, psychology in comparison to essentially every other health profession, whether that's medicine, whether that is occupational therapy, nursing, physical therapy, um, you know, each of the medical subspecialties and anesthesia and, and surgery, they all have much more active um, essentially like policy groups, right? They donate more money to Congress. They're more involved in attending meetings with lawmakers. Um, when you hold psychology up side by side compared to other health professions, psychology really ends up falling short, which means that decisions about the things that we are doing in our day-to-day -day practice, right? Whether or not, for example, neuropsychologists can uh, qualify as the physician supervisor to see Medicare patients, things like whether or not telehealth should be reimbursed or how many hours a neuropsych testing session should be um, covered under reimbursement. Those decisions are being made by people who aren't even neuropsychologists or potentially don't even know what we do. Um, and so it's really critical that neuropsychologists kind of step up to be at that table to, to be making these policy decisions. You can go ahead and click for the next slide. Additionally, leadership skills are often a requirement of the jobs in academia, healthcare, and other settings where clinical psychologists and neuropsychologists work. So regardless of your um, you know, eventual or current uh, career goals or stage, right? whether you're supervising a lab, whether you are supervising practicum students, interns, and postdocs, whether you are part of an interdisciplinary healthcare team, um, whether you're working in industry, you know, working on the executive board of a startup, or um, you know, being a founder and CEO of your own uh, company, or running a private practice, essentially any career a neuropsychologist can end up in necessitates that we have leadership skills. But go ahead and click the next slide. Despite this, I think this is often how psychologists feel when we leave our graduate training programs, right? We're put into positions of leadership by nature of our job titles and our job roles. And yet we realize like, uh oh, we, you know, we're prepared to give assessments and write reports, but we weren't prepared to be leaders. So you can go ahead and click for the next slide. Um, so looking across again, a uh, pretty wide breadth of literature, so expanding now outside of just academic medicine to look into what folks in IO psychology, in um, business, marketing education, um, think about with leadership, there are established models of leadership development. Again, although many specific models have been proposed, here's kind of like a summary of, of what they all tend to say, which is that leadership development happens in stages. So the first stage that has to take place is this um, like intrinsic agency stage or the idea of power within. So this is essentially the idea that each of us as individual neuropsychologists need to develop an identity as a leader, right? The sense of I am capable of holding leadership positions. I'm capable of advocating for myself, for my patients, for my profession. Um, and then uh, essentially being able to self-regulate um, to do this work. Um, I think, you know, many of you who have participated in leadership or advocacy opportunities in the past know that it's not all, you know, like charging into 
battle successfully. I don't know what I'm like envisioning in my mind is like leadership, right? Um, but like there's there's a lot of really boring, challenging, mundane day-to-day -day work. And there are unfortunately as well, often a lot of kind of difficult to navigate political situations, um, both within and outside of our field, right? That requires um, quite a, a good amount, again, of that intrinsic agency. You really have to believe in yourself, believe in your mission, and be able to um, manage and handle those day-to-day -day aspects of being a leader. So once you've cultivated that intrinsic agency or that power within, the next step up comes the instrumental agency or the power to. So this is the ability to actually impact change, right? This happens when you do become the PI of a lab or you become, you know, the neuropsychologist who's sitting on the interdisciplinary, um, you know, board, the brain tumor board or the epilepsy board, right? You're making decisions within your work settings about what is going to occur. But the next step kind of beyond just that instrumental agency is then substantive representation. So it's not enough to simply say that, oh, you know, our leadership board has this many neuropsychologists or this many people of color or this many, um, you know, LGBTQ folks on it. Rather, it's really necessary that there's that substantive representation, meaning that there's advocacy occurring in the actual spheres of influence. So again, I think any of us who have ever tried to make, you know, change happen within a university or a hospital or, you know, maybe especially within a VA, uh, know that being in a leadership position is not always equivalent to actually having the ability to influence um, the outcome, right? Um, it's really, really essential that um, as a part of our development of our identity as leaders of understanding what's going on, that we see not only our own selves in our own spheres, but also an understanding of all of these like intersecting systems and the layers and the levels at which change happens so that we know how to show up in those spaces um, and influence change in the places that really count. You can go ahead and click to the next slide. So when we look at leadership competencies, right, sometimes um, Julia, Mary, and I have all talked about this topic many, many times with folks in our field, and we often get the feedback of like, well, this is awesome, but like, we're already spending six plus years as students, and then another two years as fellows. Like, training for neuropsychologists is incredibly long. How do you expect us to add something else onto our training programs? So what I really want to emphasize here is that becoming a leader as a neuropsychologist doesn't really necessitate adding all that much on because the things that we are trained in, the things that we become experts in on our way to being neuropsychologists are the competencies of leaders. So taking a look at this list of competencies, right? Ethics and safety, organization, openness, the ability to nurture growth and connection, communication. You could, you know, retitle this slide neuropsychology competencies. And I, you know, maybe people would say like, well, why is an assessment on there, right? But otherwise nobody would bat an eye, right? We know that we know about ethics and communication um, and working in, in teams and, and facilitating teamwork. Um, we have the skills. I think a lot of it really comes down to then how do we apply them. So you can go ahead and click the next slide. So beyond the competencies are the leadership behaviors. So again, this is more of that rubber hitting the road, that day-to-day, -day, often kind of boring, often kind of challenging, the time where you, you know, face pushback and, and difficulty moving systems forward. This is, I think, where our training programs fall short in preparing neuropsychologists to enter the real world with the ability to enact change. Um, again, for the sake of time, I won't go through these, uh, you know, in too much detail, but things like um, being able to, you know, monitor systems. Again, it's, it's not just okay, well, did I see my patient today? Did I write my report on time? But rather, you know, how is the entire clinic operating, right? What are our referral streams? Are we um, in connection with the people that we need to be in connection to? Or are we getting referrals from people who don't really need neuropsychology, right? The ability to kind of monitor and adapt entire systems, to manage conflict, to manage teamwork, right? Those are the, the behaviors of leaders that I think we could use a little bit more work um, pushing forward in, in, in our careers. So you can go ahead and click to the next slide. Um, so our, our call to action, um, you know, as, as a group, again, as we've talked to, to people for many years about this, you know, it's something that we all care about very, very much, um, is that there, there need to be more formal education and preparation for neuropsychologists to step into these roles. And again, if we look kind of, you know, across the way at our colleagues in academic medicine, they are 
you know, trained from moment one in medical school to take on this identity as leaders, which I think is why they are, you know, represented so highly in different um, academic and healthcare settings. Um, and neuropsychology, I think, can do a lot better jobs. When we think about, okay, well, what needs to happen? The first is a thorough needs assessment. So understanding where are the gaps, where are we falling short? You can click to the next slide. The next is the selection of a suitable audience, right? Leadership and advocacy look very, very different depending on an individual's interests, goals, and personal strengths and attributes. So what is the program that we're trying to develop? Who is the right fit for it? You can go ahead and click to the next slide. Next is design of an appropriate infrastructure to support the initiative. Right. So again, I think many of us who have been in leadership positions in neuropsychology recognize they're often essentially like held up on the backs of one very passionate person who kind of keeps everything going. Right. Um, and that shouldn't that shouldn't be the case. Right. We should be able to have substantive representation without relying on one person's kind of passion and uh, also, you know, kind of exploitation and overwork. So there needs to be an infrastructure to really support those initiatives. Um, you can click to the next slide. So the next is then the design and implementation of the learning system. What does this actually look like? And I think a lot of this um, work, uh, particularly around advocacy, you know, was kind of um, a, an aspect of what was going on at the Minnesota Update Conference, right? How do we think about competencies and advocacy as neuropsychologists, right, specifically applied to our field? You can go ahead and click to the next slide. So next is an evaluation system. How do we know if it's working? How do we know that it's worth it? And then the last slide is the corresponding actions to reward success and improve on deficiencies. So again, I think a very common comment that the three of us get when we talk about advocacy work um, from often like tenured folks are, you know, comments like, wow, it's amazing that you're getting involved so early on. I didn't feel like I had time to do this until I had tenure, right? They were so focused on getting grants, getting papers, the things that are actively rewarded within academia that they felt like they didn't have time for advocacy and outreach. And again, like that's a problem. Um, it's a major systemic issue that things like work in our communities, things that directly impact the systems level factors that that uh, affect our patients, you know, on a much broader level than any one evaluation could give, like those things should be rewarded, those things matter. Um, as I mentioned, there's very little research on any of this as applied to neuropsychology. So the three of us are trying to uh, correct that with a study that we're doing right now that's part of this first step, the needs assessment of understanding what current leaders um, and advocates in neuropsychology have to say about what the field could be doing better. So I'm sending a link in the chat right now to our survey. It's going to close at the end of the month. So we would just uh, like to encourage everyone to fill it out and share it with other leaders and advocates in your network. Um, to fill it out as well. Um, and that being said, I'm going to turn the time over to Julia for her part of the presentation. Thanks, Erin. Um, so I'm going to go over kind of how do we get leadership opportunities? Where do, where do I find them? So within the field of neuropsychology, there's a lot going on in terms of leadership and advocacy. I'm sure I've missed some very important organizations here, but this is just a selection of all the different opportunities that there are available um, just within neuropsychology. This doesn't even include all of the psychology subdisciplines um, outside of neuropsychology. So just to kind of highlight a couple of where you might get involved as a trainee. So we'll start with just some examples. Um, and I picked these because I've been involved with FCN and with NAN. Um, but there are different opportunities where trainees are often involved and also where there are trainee specific slots um, on different committees. So for example, you can see all of the different subcommittees that SCN, the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology has. Um, and then SCN also has the Association for Neuropsychology Students and Trainees. Um, and those are all student specific organization or uh, committees within their organization. So some organizations also uh, designate specific slots on all committees or most committees for trainees or early career neuropsychologists. So obviously just from these three different sections, you can see that there's a lot of different spots that you might consider. So you're probably thinking right now, like, great, that's a lot. I'm overwhelmed. Where do I start? 
Um, and that makes sense because there are a ton of opportunities out there. So I have to credit Katie Block with this, um, but I think she put it, put it the best. So first you wanna kind of know yourself. What are your values, skills, or interests, and how do those maybe align with a specific committee? Um, if you're interested in research, can you help review convention uh, submissions or help review for a grant on a different committee? Um, so these identifying yourself and what values and skills you bring to the position can also help you kind of narrow down, okay, maybe I'm not interested in this committee, but this one seems like a good fit for me. Uh, the next thing is to hit the gaps. It's definitely never uh, too early or too late to get started. Um, a lot of these different positions don't have a specific set number of years you have to have been in training or, um, or they don't you know, keep you from doing it later on as well. Um, so something that I've always experienced uh, is that if there's someone there to volunteer, there's always something to be done and some way to help. So volunteer and show up. If not you, then who? Um, putting yourself out there is really important and kind of letting your good work speak for itself. Um, I think often we overestimate the amount of um, kind of commitment and ways that we can make change and how much time that's going to take, but we can also uh, decide on when we have the time to make small amounts of change as well and kind of volunteering at a conference. Um, those types of things are things that need to be done, but don't require a year long commitment, for example. So I, this is kind of a breakdown of how I think about things in terms of saying yes to new opportunities. Um, is this opportunity in line with both my values and my training or career goals? Does this fit with what I want to do either now or five years from now? And does it fit with my values? Is it something that aligns with me personally as well? If no, can we negotiate it to make it fit within my values and my goals? If it's uh, a problem with a specific responsibility, can I adjust that responsibility within the position to make it fit more in line with my goals? Can I add a piece to this position? Uh, if yes, an important consideration uh, that I think is sometimes hard to, hard to consider uh, is, do I have the bandwidth right now? What about six months from now? If I'm applying to internship or fellowship or I have a big family move or something like that coming up, what types of things might get in the way of both my personal and professional development in taking this opportunity? Now, if the opportunity doesn't align with my values and goals, then are there other opportunities within the organization or within the position that might align with these things? Um, can we get creative about how this might benefit both my development and the uh, organization at large? Uh, in terms of time, can I make the bandwidth? If, if this is something I'm really interested in, are there ways that I can adjust my other requirements to make sure I have the opportunity to say yes to this? And if no, always thanks for thinking of me, maybe next time. You always want to leave uh, the opportunity open so that in the future someone might think about you um, and not you don't want to kind of shut that off before before you um, have an opportunity to say yes in the future. Now, if all of these things align, then yay, you are ready to say yes, um, which is an exciting thing for sure. Uh, you can also kind of think big, even though we're in neuropsychology and kind of within our uh, subspecialty in the field, there's lots of different organizations out there that both directly align with our um, subspecialty, either uh, through specific research areas or populations or uh, with overarching topics. Um, I put down at the bottom APAGS, which is the American Psychological Association of Graduate Students. This is an excellent place to start um, in terms of getting leadership experience. Mary, Erin, and I have all been involved in APAGS in some way, um, and I really valued my time in APAGS for sure. 
But I think this is a good way to kind of think big and think what are your goals for leadership? What kinds of experiences do you want to get? What kinds of change do you want to enact? Um, and deciding from there how broad you want to get in terms of your advocacy experience. Other opportunities, um, this is within APA specifically, the Science Student Council is also another excellent place to start. Erin um, has some experience with that as well. Uh, minority Fellowship Program, um, and then APAG's Act, the Adv Advocacy Coordinating Team, actually put together a directory of student leadership positions. So I've put the uh, link to that here. It's very comprehensive. So you can basically go in and search and say, I'm interested in getting involved in Division 40 of AK, which is SDN. Um, who might I contact to get more information about that? And it'll show you a student who has been involved in SDN before that you can contact. Uh, something else I think that we often forget as leaders is what's happening kind of on the ground in our own state. There are different state, provincial, and territorial uh, psychological associations, SPTAs, and those are all really good places to get started um, as well. And oftentimes I find that people uh, kind of forget that they have a state psychological association, and they're one of the ones that are, uh, depending on the state, often really hungry for new, uh, new leaders and passionate advocates. So all of this in mind, kind of starting back with uh, Katie Block's suggestion of know thyself. Who are you as a leader? How do you figure that out? Uh, I'll drop a couple of resources here. Um, Dory Clark has a book called The Long Game, <laughs> and she has a strategic thinking self-assessment on her website that's almost kind of your leadership personality. Uh, quiz, so to speak. Um, so that's a good place to kind of get started in a formalized way. There are also some APA specific resources, uh, how to develop a pitch about yourself and kind of what experiences you're looking to get, the elevator pitch, um, networking suggestions, things like that. Um, and then there are also neuropsychology specific uh, professional development programs, uh, including the NAN Leadership Ambassador Development Program. SCN has a Student Leadership Development Program. Uh, and then within APA, the Practice Leadership Conference is also an opportunity. I think another thing that um, I've really benefited from is finding a leadership mentor. And in this way, you can have more than one. So I've had leadership mentors who don't know that they're my leadership mentor, but I've learned a lot from them by being a committee member on a committee with them and their chair, and I've learned from their leadership style. Um, I can think about a couple of people specifically where I love how they um, develop team cohesion and how they um, deal with conflict, different things like that. Um, you can also have leadership mentors that are more formalized. So I have a group of people that I can send a quick text or set up a meeting with to discuss challenges in my leadership development. And if you don't know how to find one, uh, ask around. Chances are that your friend knows someone who knows someone who's the perfect fit. Um, and something I think in this kind of leadership advocacy realm is that most of us are pretty passionate about helping others. So that means that we've both benefited from good mentors and like being mentors as well. Um, so most people are pretty happy to lend a helping ear um, or Thanks for thinking of me, maybe next time if they don't have the time at the moment, um, but definitely ask around. One quick uh, caveat, I'll just uh, quickly mention mentors versus sponsors. Um, so mentors have mentees and they're more offering advice or support. They can be formal and informal and they can kind of guide you along your journey. Um, sponsors, on the other hand, are, uh, they have protégés, um, and they really directly influence uh, trainees and their sponsees in terms of nominating them for positions, sending them open positions, uh, connecting them to other uh, professionals in the field who might benefit them and their goals, 
So it's important to not only have both mentors and sponsors, but also if you can be a mentor and a sponsor at some point in the future. So kind of wrapping this all up, what are the tips and tricks? Like, how do I do this? <laughs> uh, first, but not least, of course, is start small. There's always a position where you can help in some way. I've already mentioned being a conference volunteer. Um, you can do other things like volunteer to coordinate resources for one page of a website update. Um, and these are kind of little one-off experiences that you can do to build your leadership CV, so to speak, um, and also kind of get your name out there. If you're at a conference and you're scanning people in for CE credits, your face is gonna get recognized throughout the conference. Another thing is to apply, apply, and apply again. Uh, everyone has to start somewhere. And I recently went and looked back at my um, kind of early applications. I was like, dang, I got to reject it a lot. <laughs> um, and I just kind of blocked it out, which I think is probably adaptive. But uh, everyone has to start somewhere. We've all been rejected. Um, and I think it's important to talk about that and kind of take, take what you can from the experience and learn, OK, I, uh, you know, did this application this way and I didn't get accepted. Let me tweak that for the next time. Um, and over time, you kind of learn ways to improve your application as you go. Another thing is to have a long term goal. I think it's important to decide kind of where do you want to be in five years in terms of your leadership experience. Um, this will help you to kind of shape the positions that you want to accept to get to that goal. So if we go back to our little breakdown of how does this align with my values and my goals, does this um, fit my skill set now, but not where I want to be? Maybe I say no to it now, so I have time for another position that pushes me towards that goal. And remember, always keep your head up. Everyone has to start somewhere. I think it's easy for us to all get imposter syndrome. Um, but it's definitely important to remember that we are important and have a have a say in um, our field. Uh, and use your mentors. Like I said, the good ones really want to help and many are paying it forward. Um, so reach out for support from them as well. You've got this. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, what we can do now. So what, what changes need to be made moving forward to incorporate advocacy and leadership more into our work, into our identities, into our future as neuropsychologists. And of course, like with any other change, there's going to have to be a multi-pronged approach to making these changes happen. So I'm going to share over the next several slides um, some recommendations for mentees, for mentors, um, for our field in general and for programs too, in order to support what we know we need, we'll need to have uh, to have advocacy and leadership play a bigger role in our field. So next slide, please. All right, so starting with mentees, hopefully um, so far at least you feel convinced that um, advocacy and leadership roles are important to pursue. Despite any messages you might be getting in academia or any um, incentives and uh, rewards that might be lacking for leadership and advocacy, it is important for us to pursue these opportunities. And they don't have to be um, elaborate. They don't have to be huge. It could be as small as you know noticing um, that your clinic doesn't offer bilingual services and trying to work with other providers to figure out if you can get a bilingual service started. Um, and that's not small itself. That's something that can make such a huge impact for countless patients down the line. Um, so pursue opportunities for training, for behavior, or for experiential um, opportunities in leadership and advocacy training. And when you need to, it might be okay for you to advocate for that training if you feel, if you feel like it's missing in your program. Next slide. It's also important as mentees for us to conduct regular self-assessments of our own skills. This is true for any aspect of our training, right? It's true for our assessment growth. It's true for our therapy growth. The same is true for leadership and advocacy skills. It's important for us to sort of catalog where are our gaps? 
What do we know our strengths are and what can we do to build on our strengths or to fill some of these areas of growth that we're working towards in the future? So have you know, pretty often conversations with yourself about um, what you think you need to work on and where you need to focus your energy um, to, to gain those skills that you would like to get. Next slide. Um, it's important to identify which skills are not being honed in your current positions and which skills are being honed in the positions you might currently hold. So be very explicit about that. Maybe you realize that you're working a lot more in this particular task around time management, which is an advocacy or it is a leadership skill. Maybe you recognize I'm doing so much more conflict resolution than I've ever done before. That's a skill too that you can take note of. Um, and it could be helpful to include that in your CV. When you're talking about the roles that you've played in certain in certain positions, you could say took a very active role in team management and conflict resolution in this particular position. Um, that helps you stand out and helps people know, you know, more concretely what that role entailed for you and what skills you developed along the way while you were in that role. Next slide. So some recommendations from mentors. Um, it's also important for mentors to identify their own areas of growth, especially as it pertains to leadership and advocacy mentorship. Um, as we've talked about, psychology in general has sometimes lacked that very um, concrete or um, formal leadership training in our programs. A lot of students and mentors um, and professionals leave saying, I never learned how to do this formally. I picked it up along the way in different roles that I played. But um, because of that, it's not unusual for mentors to find that they themselves have gaps in certain areas of leadership and advocacy, and that's okay. It's important to be humble about that and to know where your limitations are so that you can connect your students or your mentees with other individuals who might have um, more of a strength in the area where you feel like you're lacking a little bit. Next slide. It's important for um, uh, mentors to encourage our mentees to participate in these leadership opportunities. You can explore what sorts of uh, um, concerns the mentee has, what barriers they're facing. A lot of time, uh, times there are very concrete barriers to entry into leadership roles, like not having enough time or the program not allowing the flexibility of engaging in these roles. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more too. But it's, it's good for mentors to have these ongoing conversations with mentees about how can we move things around to make this opportunity more accessible to you? Um, what can we do to alleviate any of your anxieties or your nervousness about entering a role that might feel new to you? So in which case anxiety is very normal. Having candid conversations is a good way to start if you're a mentor working with someone who's interested in a leadership or advocacy role. Next slide. Um, it's also helpful when mentors provide constructive and actionable feedback about specific skills. So saying, for example, if you're working with somebody in a mentorship role and they are holding a leadership position, um, it can be helpful to note your observations about things where you feel like they could improve or things that you notice are strengths and being very action oriented about that. So, you know, having a conversation about, I noticed that this is an area you seem to be having a little bit more of a hard time with. Can we develop some uh, potential next steps where we can work on that together, where I can help you find opportunities to fill that gap. Um, being action-oriented and being constructive um, as a keyword here so that the trainee knows that they can rely on you for really um, moving forward in a way that makes sense and that is feasible. Next slide. Um, it's important to support mentees in the development of their growth plans. A lot of times we think of leadership as sort of being a stagnant, you're either a leader or you're not kind of a phase, um, but leadership really also includes a growth. Um, and if we want to be effective leaders, we have to acknowledge that we need to continue be growing. Um, so it, here too, it's important for mentees to think about what are my growth plans for myself? Where do I want to see myself in five years and 10 years? Where am I now? And what do I need to do to get there? Um, next point, please. Um, and we also need to make sure that we're sponsoring that Juliet talked about this beautifully, the difference between sponsoring and mentoring. Um, mentors do need to also be effective sponsors for their mentees. So um, it, it connecting your mentees with other leaders in the field, with other individuals who can provide supports that you might not have for them. Um, if you see opportunities that come up in your email, forwarding those to your mentees and saying, do you want to talk about applying to this? Can I help you in any way to put your uh, materials together? So really working as sort of a, um, a champion for your mentee and helping them find that next step that's going to help them um, elevate their leadership and advocacy skills. All right, next. 
Okay, here are some recommendations for programs. Um, academic programs, healthcare programs, wherever trainees and uh, neuropsychologists might find themselves. It's very important that there is support for mentors in providing the training and feedback that mentees need around leadership and advocacy skills. So do mentors have a place to go if they would like to consult with somebody about how to help support their mentees? Do mentors know that their chairs um, are available to them if that's something that they, you know, that they would like to put their mentee in touch with for them to help grow in their knowledge of managing a department? Um, so in general, programmatic support is incredibly important. Next bullet point. Um, we also have talked about incentivizing and rewarding leadership and advocacy efforts. Um, this includes both for students in the form of annual evaluation. So being very explicit about this student participated in these many roles um, that were leadership focused. And I'm gonna put this in the, in the evaluation because I want the, uh, the training director, I want future employers to notice that these are important skills that the trainee gained. Um, and also for tenure and promotion for faculty members. Again, if a faculty member feels like they can't devote time and energy to mentoring a student in leadership because it's not something that's incentivized by the program, that makes it very hard for them uh, to be able to do. So we need programs to acknowledge that these are important skills for both the trainees and the mentors, and that we need to acknowledge and incentivize it. Next bullet point. Demonstrating flexibility around the responsibilities that the mentees have. Um, like I said, a lot of us tend to do um, some of our uh, advocacy and leadership work outside of our typical graduate school hours. And that's just not feasible for everyone, especially for people who have financial burdens and barriers that meet, lead them to have to have another job or to have um, tutoring that they do. And then it's, un it's unfortunate then for especially those individuals who are disadvantaged to have to look for these opportunities over and above what they're currently doing. So it's an it's an EDI perspective for the program to think about building in supports and um, and being flexible around the responsibilities that the mentees have so that they can gain these skills in a way that isn't a detriment to their training or to their performance in schools. Next point, um, and providing structured leadership training experiences for graduate for graduate students and for faculty. Um, programs might worry about not having faculty to, faculty to teach these courses or not knowing where to get started, but that's the beauty of consulting, of working with other contractors, of working with other departments. Um, a, a lot of times students find that they get really helpful um, advocacy training from public policy schools um, or from um, individuals who have entered the public policy space but are psychologists and by training. Um, so programs can get creative about finding ways to fill these gap areas by introducing didactics, by referring students to didactics like these, or by developing um, creative solutions to the, to the concern of not having enough time or faculty to teach the courses. All right, next slide. All right, so finally, recommendations for the profession. Um, we need to make sure that we update our doctoral competencies. We are due for an update. It's been about 10 years since we've done that, and we need to be very concrete about what those changes are gonna look like for programs. Next bullet point. Um, we also wanna make sure that continuing education has a focus on advocacy and leadership skills, because like I said, this is an ever-growing, um, a humble process where you have to keep uh, uh, developing and growing as you go on, even once you're a doctor. Uh, so it's important here for continuing education uh, courses to also have a focus on advocacy and leadership. Next bullet point. We need to develop some guidelines for best practices and how to integrate advocacy and leadership training into our education systems so that programs and mentors have less of a barrier on them to be able to do this on their own. Next bullet point. Um, and we also have to be um, sure that we're offering accessible large-scale leadership training. If the leadership training that we're offering is not accessible or if it's biased or if it has tips and skills that only work for some people but not others, then we're really doing a disservice to um, the folks who are seeking out these services. So we need to make sure that um, they're centered on accessibility and on EDI. Next slide. Um, and we need to re-envision, um, as Erin mentioned so beautifully, what our scope as psychologists and as neuropsychologists entail, and that it includes leadership and advocacy, because that's very much a part of being a neuropsychologist. All right, next slide. I'm going to wrap up with some ethical considerations. 
Um, as mentees and as mentors in leadership roles, we need to be very clear about our boundaries and about our responsibilities, especially when we hold multiple leadership roles. Um, so a lot of times I've heard students come to me and say, I just got this wonderful national position and my training director is asking me if I can advocate for our program in this national position. Those are um, awkward conversations that sometimes need to be had, but it is important for us to be very clear about our boundaries and what, our, what the limitations of our roles entail. Um, next bullet point, it's not uncommon for mentees and mentors to both serve on the same committees or sometimes for them to serve on opposing committees. That happens quite a bit and that's okay. We have to ensure that we're at least being candid and, and clear about the, about the uh, relationships that we hold in those committees and for mentors to not use any, um, any of these uh, conflicts that might come up against the mentee. Um, we need to make sure that that doesn't influence their evaluative outcomes. Next bullet point, um, we have to have frank conversations about leadership roles and how they're balanced with other training requirements. For some people, it's okay for us to take an extra year in order to build these skills because it's something we want to do long term. For others, their main priority might be to graduate as soon as possible and to get some of those other leadership skills later on. That's okay, as long as we're being frank and honest about what our goals are and that we're working towards our goals. Next bullet point, we have to respect um, the students' autonomy in making decisions about their leadership roles. A lot of times, students are treated as if they don't know what they want, or maybe they are missing something important by taking up these roles, and that um, you know mentors might think we know better. Um, but it's very important to recognize students are full-grown adults. Most of us are in the average age of, age of mid to late twenties, and we've been making important decisions our entire lives. So it's okay for students to um, express their autonomy and to make a decision that works best for them. And then the last slide is to ensure that students in leadership roles are given responsibilities that any other committee member is given. Um, in other words, we're not assistants. We don't do grunt work. We're not here to just take notes. Um, we are just like any other member, and we need to make sure that students are treated with the same respect and the same, given the same responsibilities as other members. Um, so those are some ethical considerations. I'm going to wrap up there so we have some time for questions. Um, I do want to say that APAGS is um, working very hard to create spaces for students to become, um, just for students to get experience working as leaders. Um, and so one of the things that we just did this year is um, we um, passed um, amendments to our association rules in APA, and we're hoping for bylaws amendments to pass in December that allows um, all of several of the committees on APA to have at least one student seat. So be on the lookout for that next year and in the following year uh, to apply for a role on several of the committees on APA and hopefully also some of the boards on APA um, as another opportunity to gain some leadership skills. Thank you so much. Oh, Lexi, Lexi, thank, thank you for meeting us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for a wonderful discussion. Uh, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, one states, I'm a second year postdoc and finding that I am too late to apply for most trainee positions that require year plus long commitments, but also too early for early career level positions. Do you have any suggestions seeking more leadership experience while in this in-between stage? That's an excellent um, excellent question. And I think you're so right that there are definitely some positions that um, are earmarked for early career, um, but that doesn't always start until after you've completed postdoc. Um, I think, you know, there, are, I'm sure there are at least some positions where you can still get involved um, as a postdoc, even if you don't have at least a year of training left. So look out for some of those. But in addition to that, maybe it's a good advocacy effort to contact the committees um, that you're thinking of applying to and saying, hey, look, I've run into this issue and it's really leaving me without opportunities. And I'm wondering if there's anything I can do to change the rules around this to allow some of us who are excluded uh, to play more of an active role. Um, and even just working with the committee on making those changes or in, on um, you know, getting other students who are in similar positions to sort of write a letter or something like that, even that is an advocacy effort that I think you can talk about later on um, on your CV or in other efforts as you apply for new, for new positions. 
Thank you for that. We have another question. If I don't feel ready to apply for a position in a national organization, are there any things I can do to develop my leadership skills within my program? That's a great question. Um, I think leadership can look different um, at different levels, but you can always be a leader at different levels as well. So your program itself might have um, a student committee or maybe there's an interprofessional development day that you can volunteer to host a table or show up for the research fair for undergraduate students. Those kinds of things can help you to develop not only some leadership skills in terms of communication, advocating for yourself and for um, whatever the, the program is, um, but it can also serve to bolster your CV in terms of here are the things I've done at my program level and here's how I'm a leader and an advocate so that when you do apply for national positions, you have that backup to say, here's what I've already done, here's are my, here are my skills and here's how I can benefit your organization. Um, I did also want to make just one other point about the previous question. Um, that's actually happened in a position that I was in before where someone was in an in-between training stage um, and they reached out and said, here's, here's where I'm at. And we actually changed the requirements because we didn't think about it when we submitted the you know, award criteria or whatever. Um, so we actually changed the requirements because of that. So I think even in those small ways, we can be advocates and leaders um, for future, future folks and for ourselves as well. Um, and conference volunteering is always a great place to start too. I just love conference volunteering. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. To um, provide another kind of concrete answer to that question, if your uh, program or university does not already have an ANST chapter, which is the Association of Neuropsychology Students and Trainees, it's very, very easy to set it up. It's all ANST is the student branch of Division 40. Um, they have like their own website, so it's very Googleable, like ANST. Um, and essentially, you just need to have a faculty advisor who's willing to serve like as the, the advisor role. Um, and then you immediately kind of are stepping into an institutional leadership position that you really get to shape what that looks like. Um, a lot of the ANTS groups post, you know, the onset of COVID, um, when things move virtual, became much more collaborative. So there are a lot of other ANTS leaders who are very um, excited about collaborating across universities and kind of helping you develop those leadership roles. So that's a, like another really good, very concrete way um, within your program to start getting some leadership experience. Another question is, do you have any advice for trainees in settings outside of the United States in developing leadership and advocacy skills? Yes. Um, within different subdisciplines, there are different international organizations. Um, so INS is specific to neuropsychology anyway, um, where there are specific slots for international trainees and international neuropsychologists to serve in leadership positions. Um, I think leadership development too is a broad topic. So in terms of getting hands-on on the ground experience in committee, uh, committee positions, and then also in kind of forming your own leadership uh, development, your own journey, that kind of intrinsic uh, self-assessment, I guess, that Aaron was talking about at the beginning. Um, so even if you can't find a position immediately, you can do things like seeing how your department chair handles a certain situation or finding a leadership mentor to talk through some things and help you with applications and sponsorship. Um, so I think it can be, you can be creative when, uh, when you come up with, uh, with challenges and finding a position at first. I also think if you're a member of an organization, you're eligible for a leadership role in that or, in that organization. So think about the, the organizations that you're currently a member of or would like to become a member of, um, and you should be able to find roles there too. Um, APAGS has a lot of um, international students who we've really benefited from having that perspective included. Um, so if that's, you know, if that's something you're considering, you'd be welcomed for sure, because we, um, international student concerns are definitely an area that we notice is underrepresented a lot of times. Um, APA also has a committee called the Committee on International Relations, um, and they too, I believe, will have a student seat in a couple of years, so another place for you to get involved. Um, but yes, uh, I also echo everything that Julia said.
Yeah, absolutely. To just throw another couple of organizations into the mist, um, the uh, identity-based organizations, so like Asian Neuropsych Association, Hispanic Neuropsych Society, and um, Society for Black Neuropsychology, I think all three have very active international members and again are like actively and intentionally seeking international perspectives as part of their work. Oh, another question is, how do I document my leadership and advocacy experiences on my CV? It's an excellent question. And I think a lot of times we undersell ourselves in this space, in this area. Um, you know, I think maybe it could be helpful um, to share some examples, perhaps. And I'm happy if anyone wants to reach out to me. Um, I'm, I'm sure all of us would be happy to share examples of CVs, but um, I will think I would usually think very concretely about what are the projects I completed, what are the skills that I developed in these roles, and um, what is sort of um, implicit that I can make more explicit. Um, so sometimes, you know, it feels like you spent so much time on a leadership task, but you can't really concretely state what you did. Think very hard about where did you spend your time? Was it on emails? Then it's a communication skill. Was it on planning the program? Then it's a program planning and pro program evaluation skill. Um, so think just, you know, hard about what you're doing and make those very clear and explicit. Um, I've also started to include under each role that I've held, I've started to include a section on policy initiatives. Um, and just very clearly stating, I worked on finding tra transgender bathrooms for this particular facility and outlining those on a map. That's a policy initiative in a way. So um, you can make sure, essentially make the implicit more explicit and um, don't undersell yourself. Everything that you spend time on should be highlighted in your CV. Uh, so don't feel like you're making yourself seem bigger than you are. It's more likely that you're doing the opposite. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, I got one uh, piece of advice on my CV and in my, you know, clinical section, I list, you know, neuropsychology intern at OU and here's all the things I did. And in my, I had a leadership and advocacy section, which I definitely recommend, um, but I would just list the organization and one of my mentors said, well, that looks great, but I can't tell what you did. Like, were you a committee member? Were you a chair? Um, and so I started, I changed that and put, you know, chair of X, Y, and Z. Um, and that really helped it to stand out on my CV and uh, not undersell myself, I guess. Yeah, the last kind of advice I have on that is, you know, like as we advocated for, advocacy and leadership should be their own, like, incentivized things. But while that is not the case, I think that it's also really worth having a conversation with the folks that you're involved in leadership with about like, hey, there there needs to be some kind of concrete outcome that's in the currency that matters, right? If you're in academia, then like that currency is posters, presentations, and publications. And so saying, is there a way that I can take the committee work that I'm doing and present it at a conference or write a manuscript? You know, I think leadership roles are often a great way to collaborate with co-authors outside of your institution you may not have found um, a way to work with before. Um, so not only highlighting what you did within the committee, but also using your role in that committee to, um, you know, work on those kind of really concrete, um, you know, really easily recognized kind of um, outcome products. All right. Thank you so much um, for your wonderful and helpful advice. Because we're actually out of time. And so thank you again for all the work that you do um, and also joining us today. And so for everyone else, please make sure to join us next Monday, December 12th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a lecture uh, called Incorporating Technology into Neuropsychological Assessment, Digital Tools for Tomorrow's Practice with Dr. Laura Umfleet, Laura Campbell, and Dr. Shafali Singh. Okay, have a good day. Thanks.